Hello students and welcome to Cardiac Concepts Part 2. So when we left off in class we were talking about arrhythmias and people that might have an atrial fibrillation or a ventricular fibrillation. The heart has become out of sequence. So someone that has atrial fibrillation will usually be on anticoagulant therapy. And the reason they're on that is because they don't have a good squeeze from the atrium into the ventricles, so the blood can pool or remain stationary within the atria, and when blood stops moving, it starts clotting. So another word for clotting is coagulate. So anticoagulant therapy is anti-clotting therapy. <clears throat> so there are drugs which prevent or delay the coagulation of the clotting process. And they're used to prevent thrombus formation. And remember, the thrombus is the tied down blood clot. It works by interfering with the body's ability to make prothrombin. And prothrombin is an important factor in the clotting cascade. So prothrombin time, also known as PT, is used to check whether medicine to prevent blood clots is working. Sometimes the PT test is also called the INR, or International Normalized Ratio. And that is a way to standardize the results of prothrombin tests, no matter the testing method. So prothrombin time can vary from lab to lab. So by using the INR, it uses a common index so the results can be compared. In the clinical setting, we ask patients that are on anticoagulant therapy what their INR is. And they'll usually know what it is because they go to a blood clinic and they have their INR measured every month. And it, used, it needs to be about two to three, the INR, to be considered safe for most dental treatment. <clears throat> so some dental considerations for persons that are on anticoagulant therapy. You want to ask them their most recent INR, um, determine the INR. Patients should not be instructed to stop taking the anticoagulant therapy without a direct order from their prescribing physician. You as the hygienist never tell a patient to stop taking the anticoagulant therapy. So, um, because you don't want the patient coming off of it and then something happening with their bleeding time, they either can clot or they can hemorrhage. So it is not up to us to do that if they're INR is between two to three, they are perfectly safe to have dental treatment. You wanna minimize trauma, of course, to control the bleeding. Local hemostatic measures, hemostatic, hemo means blood, static means stop. So how do we stop bleeding if patients are bleeding? It's kind of the same as like, if you have like a pimple on your face and you pop it, pressure, right? You put pressure, and press against it if it's bleeding on your face. And you can use pressure with gauze in the mouth as well if they're bleeding from an area. You also want to advise the patient to avoid really brushing their gums to try to get them bleeding. So those are just some dental considerations. But in general, I mean, almost at all of the time, patients are perfectly safe to treat if their INR is between two and three and they're taking that anticoagulant therapy. Okay, cerebrovascular accident, known by <clears throat> laypersons as a stroke. So it occurs suddenly and the brain tissue is injured or destroyed by hemorrhage, so that's bleeding causing pressure or ischemia. Ischemia is the lack of blood flow oxygen to the brain. 
caused by a clot, thrombus, sorry, embolus. A transient ischemic attack is sort of like a mini stroke or a warning. So it's a temporary period of symptoms similar to those of a stroke. The patient's face can look a little lopsided. They can talk strangely, but it only lasts for a few minutes. The patient might not even be aware that it's happened and it doesn't cause any permanent damage. However, it is a warning and it has the potential to become a stroke or a cerebrovascular accident so if you see something like that happen, you want to make sure that you tell the patient that what happened, like I saw a side of your face droop, or you were talking and I couldn't understand what you were saying because they need to follow up with their physician. So causes of C CVAs are um, lack of oxygen to the brain tissue, and infarction death of the brain tissue caused by the ischemia or an embolism. Thrombus has become detached. It has escaped. It's now an embolism. An embolism, of course, is not always blood. A thrombus is always blood. It's attached. It's a blood clot. An embolus can be a piece of that fatty plaque that builds up inside our arteries that's been released. It could be air. It could also be blood. And additionally, another um, cause of a CVA is cerebral hemorrhage, where potentially um, a vessel has burst in the brain, causing bleeding. And that bleeding causes pressure because the cranium is a closed cap, like a in enclosed space. So the increased pressure has nowhere to go, and so it ends up pressing on the brain tissue. And, damaging it that way. So the most common type of stroke is ischemic. So the ischemic stroke occurs when a clot blocks a blood vessel that feeds the brain. You may also hear the term cerebral infarction in connection with an ischemic stroke. So the clot has blocked the blood vessel that feeds the brain and because of that the brain tissue dies, that's the cerebral infarction. An infarct is an area of necrosis, necro means death, that's tissue death due to the blood vessel blockage. So ischemia can be caused by atherosclerosis, it can be caused by those fatty deposits that we get around our heart, but we can also get those in the brain. Um, we can also get them in the vessels in our neck leading up to our brain so those can become narrowed, causing an ischemia, or a thrombosis, which results in death of brain tissue. The blood clot can travel from a different, um, become detached, the thrombosis can become, de thrombus can become detached, travel through the circulatory system and end up in the brain, causing death to brain tissue if one of those arteries that feed the brain get blocked. So this here shows the middle cerebral artery coming up to feed the brain with a lot of blood. Um, and in one area, you can see it gets blocked by a blood clot, um, or it can also be blocked by this piece of fat that has become detached. Maybe it became detached from the heart and traveled the coronary arteries and traveled up to the brain. Um, it could also be a part um, these fatty deposits can also build up in the arteries in the neck that lead up to the brain. So lots of different reasons to have an ischemic cerebrovascular accident. So a cerebral embolism, this is often referred to as an embolic stroke, occurs when a blood clot forms in another part of the body, often the heart or the arteries in the upper chest and neck and moves through the bloodstream until it hits an artery that's too narrow to let it pass. So that embolus becomes lodged in the cerebral vessel and reduces or cuts off blood flow to an area of the brain.
So cerebral hemorrhage is uncontrolled bleeding in the brain. An artery can rupture and fill the cranium, which is closed with blood. And that increase in pressure within the cranium displaces brain tissue, causes edema, and leads to death of brain tissue. Common causes of cerebral hemorrhage are an aneurysm and also hypertension. Cerebral hemorrhage in a younger person, a person um, less than 50 years of age, is usually the result of an accident. They've hit their head, they've been in a car accident. So causes of hemorrhage and aneurysm. So an aneurysm is a weakening in the vessel wall. And this weakness in the vessel wall causes a sac to sort of bulge out of the blood vessel and then that's known as an aneurysm. And you can have a cerebral aneurysm, so this is a weakening, you could have a bulge and you have weaker vessels, so that weakness in the vessel wall, but you can also have aortic aneurysms. You have, there's a lot of different areas in your body that can have aneurysms, not just your brain. Another um, reason that you may have a cerebral hemorrhage is you have long-term hypertension and that chronic condition over a long period of time can weaken blood vessel walls. Untreated high blood pressure is a major preventable cause of brain hemorrhage. So spotting a stroke, learn the warning signs, act fast. Balance, they may be a little off balance, something um, that a person may say is this is the worst headache of my life. They may have visual disturbances. They may have a unilateral, meaning on one side, um, drooping of their face and lips. They may have arm or leg weakness. Sometimes if you see them do um, sort of like the brain test, they'll, you know, oh, they'll try, you know, squeeze my hands, squeeze my fingers. They'll try to like, Resist me pushing your arms out, resist me pushing your arms in to check to make sure that the strength on both sides of your body is the same. Their speech could be diffi um, difficult to understand. It's almost like garbled, like it's just not even words that are coming out of their mouth. And then time. Sooner you call, and activate EMS, the better the outcome from the patient. There are drugs that can actually reverse an ischemic stroke very readily. However, if you give that drug to someone that's having a hemorrhagic stroke, it could kill them. It's called TPA. We'll talk more about it in FARM. It's very difficult to tell initially what is causing the stroke. And so they'll, and 90% of strokes are ischemic strokes, not hemorrhagic strokes. So when you get to the hospital, sometimes you, they'll ask if they think you're having a stroke to sign off that you're willing to take this medication because the medication that's used, and if it is an ischemic stroke, it can actually make it that you have almost no long-term consequences. In the past, people would have to relearn how to walk, talk, feed themselves. So the drug is a miracle unless you're having the hemorrhagic stroke, which case it can cause even more bleeding. So dental therapy, we wanna look for signs and symptoms of like that mini stroke, that warning, that transient or temporary ischemic attack. Patients with a history of hypertension or heart disease, it's the pre one of the um, most preventable, untreated hypertension, most preventable thing associated with having a stroke. Elective dental treatment, same thing with MI, six months. 
We want to make sure we're doing a stress reduction protocol and checking vitals. Be aware that patients may be on anticoagulant therapy and you'll need to know their INR. Home care adaptations and for that. So after a stroke, it's common for the hand on the opposite side of the body from which the stroke was on to clench into a fist and the fingers to curl into themselves. So and this is a result of something called severe spasticity. It's very, it's when someone is very, very rigid uh, and that has to do with a disconnection between the brain and the muscles. So sometimes when someone has had a stroke, you may notice that their hand is kind of curled in and then their arm also may be sort of against their body curled in as well. So if it is on, if it is in the hand, their dominant hand, if they're a right-handed person and it's on their right hand, you know, they may need some accommodations on how to um, hold a toothbrush. You know, they might need a wider toothbrush handle someone that has lost use of their hand, you want to be aware of that and not say, well, you need to floss your teeth every day with the string floss. They won't be able to hold it. So you need to come up with some adaptations for those patients. If you believe someone is having a stroke while they're in your chair, you know, terminate treatment, do, you know, activate, BLS or initiate BLS, activate EMS, you can give them oxygen, right? We need an ambulance there. Do not give them aspirin. If it's a hemorrhagic stroke, it would be contraindicated to give them something that would make them bleed more. It's unlikely it's a hemorrhagic stroke, but you don't know. Next, we'll be talking about congenital heart disorders and congenital heart defects. These are heart issues that people are born with. Sometimes they're so, the patient doesn't even know they have them until they're an adult because they're very minor and it just happens to be found on a test. An incidental finding is what it's called. So what causes the defects of the heart or defects in general, congenital defects, lots of different things. Genetics, they may be missing one or more genes or might have a change or a mutation in a gene. They could have chromosomal problems, such as with Turner syndrome when a chromosome is missing. They may have Down syndrome when a child has extra chromosomes, exposure to different drugs during um, pregnancy, someone has, it misuses alcohol, it can cause fetal alcohol syndrome. If you have an infection during pregnancy, someone, um, they have Zika virus that can cause a serious defect in the brain. And you know, lack of certain nutrients, folic acid can cause problems with the spinal cord. So there's lots of different reasons why someone is born with certain genetic or excuse me congenital defects not always of the heart sometimes it's of the heart and sometimes it's other areas of the body <clears throat> so why do we want to know so specifically right now we'll focus on the heart why do we want to know in dentistry if someone was born with a heart defect well the number one reason would be prevention of infective endocarditis because some defects, repaired and unrepaired, may require premedication. Patients with heart defects may develop something called polycythemia, which is a type of blood cancer. It makes your bone marrow make too many red blood cells. And when you have too many red blood cells, it makes your blood really thick. And that slows the flow and that can cause severe blood clotting to happen. You can also, with heart defects, lead to something called thrombocytopenia, and that's a lack of circulating platelets. So poly means many, so we can think of many red blood cells. Thrombocytopenia is not enough platelets. 
some of the signs that you may see in the oral cavity of petechiae, hematoma, which is a bruise, and they also are um, may bleed more during treatment. So some congenital heart diseases that exist is something called shunting. And when I think about shunting, I think about shoving because blood gets shoved from one side to the other. It's the cardiac blood flow kind of takes a shortcut. It doesn't go through the valves. And the reason it doesn't go through the valves the normal way is that there's a hole in the septum that usually separate the atria or the ventricles. So what can happen is blood can be moved from the right side of the heart to the left side or the left side to the right side through a hole in the septum and it can be a ventricle, ventricular septal defect or an atrial septal defect. So the hole can be in the septum. Remember the septum is the wall between the two atria, the filling chambers on the top or it can be in the septum, the thicker septum that's between the two ventricles or the pushing chambers on the bottom. So there can be a hole through that. And so shunting, the blood can get shoved from one side to the other. In general, the shoving of the blood is from the left side of the heart to the right because the left side of the heart, now that's the side of the heart, that left ventricle, that's the big guy that's pushing blood up and out through the aorta to the rest of our body. So the pressure, right, and the size of the left side of the heart is bigger, and since the pressure and the size is bigger, blood tends to be pushed to the right side. When blood is pushed to the right side, it can cause volume overload. So now you have a lot of blood on one side and that can make that side of the heart enlarge. An additional thing that happens is it mixes the oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood together and so occasionally someone will have cyanosis or depending on the congenital heart disease and shunting that they have they can kind of lack the oxygen getting to their extremities the way a heart whose septums are in place would. So let's see. So here is an atrial in the atrium, septal, the septum defect. And it's a birth defect of the heart, in which is a hole in the wall that divides those upper filling chambers. The hole can vary in size and may close on its own or it may require surgery. A ventricular, here we go, ventricles, septal defect is also a birth defect of the heart in which there is a hole in the wall, the septum, that separates the two lower pushing chambers. So here we can see that left ventricle, the left atria, the left ventricle, we have a ventricular septal defect here. Blood is getting shunted or shoved to the right side. The right side will see that volume overload because there's more blood here now than normally would be. You will get the muscle of the heart on the right side to enlarge, but eventually the right side of the heart will begin to fail. The type of repair that's done for these defects determines if antibiotic prophylaxis is indicated. So depending on what materials they use, so if someone comes in, they've had a vent ventricular septal defect repair or an atrial, Septal defect repaired will have to have a medical consultation letter sent to their cardiac surgeon to determine if antibiotic prophylaxis is indicated. So that's shunting, blood shunting. 
and we also have malformations. So before a baby is born, the fetus's blood does not go to the lungs to get oxygenated, right? The baby is not breathing in air. So the ductus arteriosus is a hole that allows the blood to skip the circulation to the lungs. However, when the baby is born, the blood must receive oxygen in the lungs, so this hole is supposed to close. If the ductus arteriosus is still open, in open, another word for open is patent, the blood may skip this necessary step of circulation. So this open hole is called the patent ductus arteriosus. In most babies who have an otherwise normal heart, the patent ductus arteriosus will shrink and close on its own in the first few days of life. If it stays open longer, it may cause extra blood to flow to the lungs. So patent ductus arteriosus creates left to right shunt Additionally, pulmonary hypotension, hypertension because that extra blood flow to the lungs and it also overburdens the heart. Another malformation of the heart is coarctation of the aorta. So this is the aorta. Now the aorta is left ventricle to the aorta out to the rest of the body is more narrow. If, it's, if the narrowing is severe enough and it is not diagnosed, the baby may have serious problems or may need surgery or other procedures soon after birth. So for this reason, a coarctation of the aorta is often considered a critical congenital heart defect. The narrowing of the aorta usually happens in the part of the blood vessel just after the arteries branch off to take blood to the head and the arms, and it's actually near the patent ductus arteriosus, although sometimes the narrowing of the aorta occurs before or after the ductus arteriosus. So this narrowing here, or coarctation, now that's just a fancy word for narrowing, blocks normal blood flow to the body. And this can back up the flow into the left ventricle, it goes back to the left ventricle, making the muscles in the ventricle work harder to get the blood out of the heart. This needs or requires early surgical intervention. Additionally, this coarctation of the aorta usually is not seen by itself. There are usually other heart defects that go along with it. Another malformation of the heart is called tetralogy of fallow. Te tetra means four. So there are four defects of the heart and its blood vessels. So there's usually a hole between the left and right ventricle, so a ventricular septal defect. The pulmonary valve and pulmonary artery are narrowed. Another word for narrowed, so we knew coarctation is narrow, but stenosis is also a narrowing. So now that pulmonary, we have pulmonary stenosis. The aortic valve which opens to the aorta is enlarged and seems to open from both ventricles. The right ventricle, right down here, is thicker than normal, and this is called ventricular hypertrophy. And then the aorta, three. So the aorta, instead of being at the top, it actually is attached closer to the ventricular septal defect. 
This is also considered a critical congenital heart defect. The heart defect tetralogy of LO means that the blood that flows to the rest of the body is reduced. Infants with tetralogy of LO usually have a bluish looking skin color called cyanosis because their blood doesn't carry enough oxygen. Occasionally, the child will look blue during crying or feeding, and these episodes are called tet spells. This requires corrective surgery and antibiotic prophylaxis before dental treatment. So dental considerations for congenital heart diseases and defects, you must determine the type of defect and how and when it was repaired. Absorbable sutures and autogenous grafts are the least susceptible to developing infective endocarditis. Synthetic grafts made out of Dacron are more susceptible to infective endocarditis for a longer time period. Valvular heart disease type. So we just talked about stenosis, the pulmonary artery, in Tetralogy FLO. We also could have stenosis or narrowing of valve openings. We could also have something called valvular insufficiency. So valves in the heart, tricuspid, pulmonic, tricuspid, pulmonic, my, um, mitral, and then aortic valves should snap shut once the blood is pushed through and it prevents backflow of blood. When blood backflows through like a flappy or floppy valve, that's called regurgitation, which is like spit back. We want a good snapping of the valve shut so no blood gets kind of backflowed back from where it came. And there are a lot of causes of this. Sometimes it's unknown. Sometimes it's an infection in the past, an infective endocarditis in the past. Sometimes the hypertension is so significant that tension or high pressure can cause valves to blow open a little bit. Sometimes you're born that way. Sometimes it has to do with atherosclerosis. And you may have had an episode of rheumatic fever and developed rheumatic heart disease from that. So valvular stenosis, it's a narrowing of the valve in the large blood vessels, usually branching off the aorta. This narrowing keeps the valve from opening fully, which reduces the blood flow to the body and makes the heart work harder. So the heart may weaken, you may get angina from this, fatigue, shortness of breath. Mild cases may not need treatment. In severe cases of valvular stenosis, when the valve is narrowed and you have an increase in blood pressure and blood volume, surgery can repair or replace the valve. So valvular insufficiency is the valve is kind of floppy. It doesn't close completely. So we can see here the aortic valve Right? We want to see that snap closed, and here is when it's regurgitating and leaking back into the heart. So if you do have that valve replaced, it can be um, with a biological material or a mechanical valve. So patients that have had valves replaced in their heart, they may be on certain anticoagulants to prevent blood clots, dental considerations. They may have had a surgery to replace the valve or repair it. Dental considerations, antibiotic prophylaxis. 
for infecto and infective endocarditis only if they have a valve replacement. And then we will need a consultation to figure out if their um, what their INR is. We don't need a medical consult unless it's their first time. We need to find out do they need antibiotic prophylaxis? That would be the first step. But if they were on antibiotic, uh, excuse me, anticoagulant therapy, as long as their INR was between two and three, they would be safe to treat. So if you have a patient that has some sort of heart problem, heart valve replacement, they are most likely, if not 100%, going into antibiotic prophylaxis for that. Rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease. All right, so rheumatic fever it can occur after a throat infection from the bacteria Group A streptococcus. Group A streptococcus infections of the throat cause strep throat or less commonly scarlet fever. Group A streptococcus infections of the skin rarely trigger rheumatic fever. So the link between strep infection and rheumatic fever isn't clear, but it appears that the bacteria trick the immune system. So the streptococcus bacteria contain a protein similar to the one found in certain tissues of the body. The body's immune system, which normally targets infection-causing bacteria, starts to attack its own tissue, particularly tissues of the heart, joints, skin, and central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. The immune system reaction results in a swelling of the tissues or an inflammation. If your child receives prompt treatment with an antibiotic to eliminate the strep bacteria and takes all the me medications prescribed, there's very little chance of developing rheumatic fever. If your child has one or more episodes of strep throat or scarlet fever that aren't treated or aren't treated completely, they may develop rheumatic fever. So it's a systemic inflammatory disease, lots of different things that can happen you know, arthritis in the joints because now your body is attacking its own tissues. The jerky muscle movements are if the um, bacteria attack the central nervous system. You can also get a ring-like rash and subcutaneous nodules, like you have like little balls under your skin. And then the heart can be affected in about 50% of the cases of rheumatic fever, the person develops rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic heart disease and rheumatic fever are very, very rare in the United States. So rheumatic heart disease is the cardiac damage from an acute attack of rheumatic fever. This can cause deformity of the valves. Dental management. Antibiotic prophylaxis, that used to be a big deal for people with rheumatic heart disease. It's no longer recommended for patients with rheumatic heart disease before dental treatment. So no more antibiotic prophylaxis for them. And so I've been talking a lot about infective endocarditis. What the heck is it? Well, it's an infection of the heart chambers or valves. So the bacteria that grow in your mouth have an affinity or a love for the valves or chambers of our heart, some prosthetic joints, and they can kind of get caught there and create these little growths, like these vegetative growths, they're called. And this is very bad, um, can be life ending to have this bacteria growing on the heart chambers or on the valves of the heart. And this person that has passed away from it, in this yellow here, these are the vegetative growths that occur from the bacteria that infect the endo, um, the portion of the heart, the endocardium. Okay. Nope, got another picture here, and it's that yellow part that's growing and infecting the heart. How do we prevent that? Well, there's very few heart issues and very limited joint issues, 
even though the list looks big, it's really not that big. Very rare that we need antibiotic prophylaxis because the bacteremia, so when you clean or scale someone's teeth, you get something called a transient bacteremia, a temporary increase in the bacteria in the bloodstream. And so the thought is if you put antibiotics in the bloodstream to fight that transient bacteremia from the dental cleaning or extraction, the person will get these vegetative growths on their heart. However, you create transient bacteremias when you poop, when you brush your teeth and floss your teeth, all types of things create bacteremias in our bloodstream and our immune system responds and takes care of the bacteria. Persons at risk for infective endocarditis with certain types of heart defects or heart repairs should maintain meticulous um, home hygiene. That is the way to prevent this from happening because if you're removing and breaking up those bacterial colonies every day on your own, that is the most important step in preventing this from happening. So American Heart Association, who needs to take antibiotics before dental work? People with prosthetic cardiac valves, if they've had prosthetic materials used in the heart valve repair, instead of having a fake valve put in, if it's just been repaired, um, if they've had previous endocarditis, if they have an unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart defect. So an unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart defect, cyanotic congenital heart defects are ones where we have a lot more deoxygenated blood. That would be one of the like uh, tet tetralogy of fellow is considered a cyanotic congenital heart defect. Be very unlikely that that wouldn't be repaired as a young person, an infant. If they have a repaired congenital heart defect with residual, residual shunts, or if they're getting that kind of blood spit back, the valves are still regurgitating at the site adjacent to the site of the prosthetic patch or prosthetic device. Heart transplant with valve regurgitation due to a structurally abnormal valve. So you've had your heart transplanted and the new heart also has valvular regurgitation because of an abnormal valve. So these are pretty rare, not totally unheard of, but very few heart conditions now need antibiotic prophylaxis. And so for the patient that does need it, how can we best plan, especially for multiple appointments? So we want to combine treatments to limit the number of point appointments, right? Now they are taking antibiotics. You don't want to see them seven, eight, nine, ten times. Additionally, if you want to use the same antibiotic, so there is a philosophy that if you take an antibiotic once, if you take it again within 9 to 14 days, it will be less effective. They should use an alternative antibiotic. If your patient comes in on a Wednesday, they've had a heart transplant, and you want them to come in the next Wednesday, it's recommended that you use an alternative antibiotic on the list, not the same one. If you want to use the same one, it would be ideal. It's nine, but ideally 14 days apart for the appointments. And again, meticulous oral hygiene is the most important factor to avoid infective endocarditis.